Good afternoon. Thank you very much for joining uh, my, my colleague Faisal and myself. Um, my name is Peter Hubbard. I am a principal consultant for Pink Elephant Amir. Uh, I have a specialization in, in uh, designing and creating configuration management databases and conflict management systems. Faisal, would you like to quickly introduce yourself? Sure. Um, my name is Faisal Osmani. I'm the business development and strategy lead for telecommunications at Scient. So I have a focus on service management and assurance and ITSM. And um, I'll be talking a little bit later about a case study um, and uh, how CMDB can reflect into operational and operational insights. Perfect. Okay. Well, the way we're going to do this is we try to split this into two parts, not, not particularly equal, but uh, I, I get the lion's share. I, I, I won, or depending on how you view it, lost the toy cost, so I get to talk more about how to actually handle the implementation, and then Faisal gets all the glory of talking about and how it actually works in practice. <laughs> so for the first part, I'm going to handle this as I, as I map out the, um, well, the traditional approach to doing it, pointing out all the ways that it can go hideously wrong, and then bring it back in topic by bringing in say, and this is how we have found that it works. I'll then hand over to Faisal and he can talk, bring us, bring us down and talk about what it will look like in the real world. If I could please I mean, encourage anyone from the audience at any time, please do fire questions. There will hopefully be time at the other end. But if you have a question as we go through, please feel free to ask them. So. Without further ado, uh, a very quick introduction for myself. I've worked within service management for about the last 20 years. Uh, if you can name a position and an industry, I've probably done it in it. Um, currently, I'm working a lot with the higher education sector, University of Oxford, Oxford, those sorts of areas, having lots of fun. I have been a configuration manager. I've been a change manager. I have designed CMDBs and CMSs all over the place and having done it for nearly 20, 20 years I've really managed to get very good at finding new ways to fail until I actually found ways that worked so let's have a look at this then let's start with the basics IT system management technologies by individual silos the old classic it's how IT grew up it's how we tend to think and it's not very useful so I have individual silos, some doing servers, networks, and so on. The business, the organization says, I want email, 98% available. At the most classic level, each one of our um, silos will say, well, my level was available, my silo was there for 98%, and the business is left saying, well, that's great, but I, I couldn't use it. Something was broken. So we want to move from system into service management, which means that I need the ability to say, and what makes up my service? Oh, hello. <laughs> and my network is just, just a, there we go, IT system into IT service. There we go. The ability to say within these towers where, you know, sort of which particular parts make up your service. So, so as I can work out what makes up your service, I can talk to you much better and say, well, your particular service was made up of, and here's what happened with. This is all old news. This is well understood. If you've ever done anything remotely near idle, this is fed to you with your mother's milk almost. Now, there are a few issues with that because the, the idle book presents the config management database and its bigger brother, the config management system. It could potentially be worth my while just to quickly explaining the differences between the two. A conflict management database is a, you know, it's a relational database that says this is what I've got, this is what's related to it. So this server is related to that network node, this network node is related to this software. A conflict management system is the CMDB related into other tools so I can now see what incidents, problems, changes, configurations, have changed on my database. All of this is of interest only to academics because if you've got a decent ITSM tool set, one of the, one, one of the big boys, Hornbill, ServiceNow, Remedy, one of those sorts of areas, you've already got a CMS. It's just not, just might not be called that. This is where our problems start. The config management system that is presented to you if you, if you go off and do form IT service management training. It's presented as in this is normal. Well, that's not normal. What you're actually asking for is this. 
If you want a database that's capable of understanding what you have, what's connected to it, what makes it up, what's happened to it, and so on and so on and so on, what you are actually asking for is Skynet. This is a, a queryable database that I want to be able to use and actually uh, understand things that my humans themselves don't know yet. It's not impossible, but let's be clear, trying to build a config management system or a CMDB is hard work. And this is where it starts to go wrong. I'm gonna to talk to you about the creation and I'm gonna spend the first, about the next five minutes depressing the heck out of any of you listening who actually have to go and create one of these things. As I say, this is actually what it is that you're trying to do. Then I'll flip it around and say, and here's how to do it. So here's some work, um, work based on some stuff that we did with a client within the last year or so. They had 100 services, they had 150 servers, 300 virtual, and so on and so on and so on. So those were the items on the left-hand side. They had almost 8,000 items they wanted to control. Well, to actually work out what makes up a service required about six technicians, one from each of the major areas, desktops, networks, and so on and so on. Because the only way to find out what makes up a service, a logical entity, something that doesn't exist, is to get the people who have the information in their, um, in their heads, the humans, put them in a room with a whole pile of post-it notes and say, can you guys map what makes this service? Because I have to tell the tool what makes this service. Once I've got that information, it should be easy to keep it up to date. Well, it took us six services, about three hours. It was a morning or an afternoon for each one as we worked out what actually was involved. So six times three times 79, that worked out to ooh, about 338 man days. But it's all right, we've got tools that can automatically discover stuff, haven't you? Mm, for a given value of discover, possibly. What you might have is the ability to see that you've got a network connection between two bits of kit. Where's the bit that actually comes across the top and says, and those areas are part of this logical infrastructure. These areas relate to that logical service. How about it include such areas as your documentation, your governing policies, your software licenses? Tools don't cover these. I'm not saying tools are not useful. They are amazingly, as I hope to show you later, useful. But anyone who's selling you a config management system with, don't worry, the tool will sort this, is trying to sell you a bill of goods. Okay? Once I've got this, I've put it into my CMDB and config, and it's, I just have to keep it up to date. Well, let's just go back to this one we looked at. Each, okay, the golden rule with the CMDB is it's a tool, it's a database, it's information. Like any tool, if there's no use, there's no value. Well, the quickest way to make sure that there is no use is to provide people with untrustworthy data. In fact, that's what I tend to find has happened most times. Most organizations are not trying an initial greenfield implementation of a CMDB or a CMS. They're picking up one that existed before and trying again. When you dig into, well, why was it dropped the last time, the response is, Normally, the technical teams who were supposed to be using it didn't trust the data and so started keeping their own spreadsheets again because they knew they could trust that. Well, the quickest way to make sure you don't, you know, if you uh, have untrustworthy data, is to overwhelm your ability to curate that data. So I have 8,000 items. Each one has 35 attributes on it, name, location, status. So I have almost, well, I have well over a quarter of a million bits of connected data. In addition to that, that's not even talking about all the highly changeable relationships. For that organization each week, 110 changes got made and each change affected on average three CIs, meaning each month you were getting, depending on how long the month was, about 500 CIs being changed. So 7% of your database was changing every single month. This is a lot of work to keep it up to date. Don't forget, if it's not up to date, it dies because people don't trust it anymore. So what I'd like to do is explicitly at this point out, just call out a couple of questions that you just think about if you're listening in. The only, only tool set that I can find that I can equate a config management system to 
is SAP, or an ERP tool set. This is a massive collection of databases that is designed to pull together information from multiple sources and show it to all those who need to know about it. Quick question, so I thought I might bring you in on this one. In your experience, SAP teams, when they are supporting uh, organizations, are they just one person? No, indeed, no. There are multiple teams and multiple uh, resources who are there who are required to support um, you know, a set of tool sets or different mm -hmm. tools that are there. And that multitude of tool sets and how much resource you have to assign to support it is very critical in, our, in, in an operational environment. Absolutely. I mean, sort of the, this, this is one of the things is that the business sees the value in something like an ERP. And it's, I've seen sort of like 10 people, 15, 20, 30 people whose job it is simply to look after that. Okay, well, the CMDB is my equivalent of it. How much resource do you have assigned to support your CMDB, which is approximately as difficult to keep up to date? If you're lucky, hmm, we'd reckon size of one person every third Tuesday might take a look at it. Yeah, that, that sounds about right. <laughs> so is there any wonder that CMDBs tend to die? Because we've conditioned ourselves to believe that simply because something can be tracked, it should be tracked, and it must go into the CMDB. What happens is we massively overwhelm our capability to curate the data and keep it accurate and up to date, which leads you to the inaccurate CMDB, which leads you to yet another failed implementation. All right, now, I, now that I've thoroughly depressed everyone, I'm quite impressed. I have been watching to see if anyone actually dropped out, decided by the time they reached this point and went, yeah, okay, obviously we're doomed. We don't need a CMB. They're terrible. Wait, 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 wait. Don't throw the baby out with the bathwater. It's not actually that hard to get yourself a useful CMDB. Now I'm going to start moving into how to do this. Okay? So, first thing. This is literally day one. You're, you need to understand you have three basic choices, three approaches to making a config management system. First is go big. Admit to yourself that what you're trying to do is curate hundreds of thousands, potentially millions of bits of interconnected data in a highly mobile, agile configuration. Real, admit to yourself this will need an awful lot of resource to keep it up to date. Admit that what you're trying to build is SAP and resource it appropriately. I now pause to hear the um, howls of laughter from around the globe of people listening of the idea of, of the IT being able to convince the business on, I need 30 people doing nothing but looking after this database that you don't understand, but I'm trying to convince you is important. They just won't wear it. No chance. If you manage to get that and you've got 30 full-time um, CMDB people, Congratulations, please do contact me. I want to come and see it myself. So if the go big option is not actually relevant or achievable, we'll go small. And this is where you actually start to realize, well, what is the point of a CMDB? A CMDB is a tool, okay? It is body armor, it is protection. The config management database is usually there to protect you. It comes back to the, like I say, well, you'll see in a bit when I, ask, when I start laying out here are the steps to get yourself a CMDB. The first one starts with what is the goal of this tool? Nine times out of eight, the goal tends to be we need to help change management understand what it is that they are changing. And then it moves on from there into we want to help incidents, we want to help problems, we want to help, and so on, and so on, and so on. That's fine. What I need to understand is what is the goal? because I only want to track information relevant to that goal. Okay? Right. The third option, which is an amazingly popular one, is you can try it and fail. There's something called the 5% club in the industry. Only about 5% of organizations that try to make a CMDB actually make it all the way through. So the first thing which I'm going to say, the first big tip I have for everyone who's listening is understand, uh, understand and move away from the idle and the tool set vendor's point of view of this all singing, all dancing, it'll do everything for you, unless you're willing to go down the sap route. Now you move that to one side, focus on 
What do I need to do in order to reach my goal? And once you know that, these are the steps to go through. Next step, understand the difference between inventory, asset, and configuration management. Now, a question I normally ask my delegates if I'm tutoring or the people I'm working with if I'm designing is, everyone know what a CI is? Configuration item, easy, no problem. Do you know why it's called a configuration item? And usually there's this stunned silence. The answer is to show that it is different. I have inventory items, I have asset items, I have configuration items. This is the next danger spot where it goes wrong. Inventory items, I just want to know what have I got and where is it? How many of these have I got? I will do asset management and lots of things because it's easy. The tools can do this stuff for me. Great, fantastic, love it. I'll do inventory management on 100,000 different items without breaking a sweat. That's not config. I'll then have the next layer up, asset management. I want to know what have I got, where is it, how much did it cost me, has it been depreciated, how far through its life cycle is it? Now, I call those asset items because they are um, a subset of the inventory of the 100,000, maybe there are 20,000 items I actually want to track. It's worth my while investing that extra energy and effort, particularly as if I'm doing asset, probably this is not things that can be picked up by tools very easily because it's the cost, the depreciation cycle, and so on and so forth. So out of those 100,000, I might only pick up 30,000, let's say, which are assets. That's brilliant. That's not config. Config items is the inner sanctum. Something does not get to be a CI unless I really, 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 really care about it. Because that means I've just signed up to track the inventory information about it, the asset information about it, and the relationship information. What you should be doing is focusing in each time. 100,000 assets, 30,000, um, sorry, 100,000 inventory items, 30,000 assets, 10,000 um, configuration items. That is the core. That's what I'm trying to protect. But unfortunately, what do we tend to do in IT? Oh, look, but my tools will handle this, and suddenly I'm trying to perform inventory management to a level of configuration management. It's not needed, and it's actively harmful. Okay? You don't need full-on config for everything. These are different capabilities that you get. If you want to see information about it, inventory item. Inventory does it. If I want to link in problems and stuff to it, incidents, problems, changes, fantastic. Can I put it in the database but not show it in the view when I say, make it my CMDB? It's a relatively simple um, procedure to be able to say to a tool set vendor, could you put a little um, button in here which says, show in T CMDB? When I tick it, that will show up and have the relationships mapped on it. If I don't tip it, tick it, yeah, I can link incidents. Yes, I can link problems. Yes, I can link changes. But it doesn't show up in my CMDB. It's not showing up in my impact assessment. And it means that I am not guaranteeing that that information is absolutely 170,000% accurate, which is what I'm signing up for if I'm going to be doing a CMDB. Oh. There's an example of a two-tier system here. Around the outside, inventory and asset items. I just need to know we've got a PC. I want to know what incidents have happened on that PC. I don't want it showing up in the middle where I'm starting to get all my relationships and all these areas coming in. It gets too confusing. So how do I get one of these things? Right, well, here you go. This is the approach that we use and tends to work quite nicely. First thing you have to have as for any tool is a goal. What you are creating is a tool. What is the point of that tool? And this is normally skipped. When I ask and say, why are you creating a CMDB? The normal response is, I don't know, ITIL said that we should have one, or the tool, said, the tool vendors said it was really important. Okay, a few questions. Why do you want one? Who is going to use it? What are they going to use it for? Very simple questions. Once you, once you know this, I need to help change management assess high-risk changes. Great, thanks. What CIs are required to meet that goal? 
For example, if you said, I want to track change management, you know, sorry, I want to support change management and high risk changes, well, nine times out of ten, change management are not involved in changes on individual PCs. Why have you tried to put 100,000 PCs into my CMDB? They are not helping in the goal, and they are out of, you know, they actually drain my resources away from maintaining the important things. Leave that information in my inventory tools. Put it somewhere else if you want to, or put it on a separate layer. Now what I want to be able to do is make sure that everybody has the same approach to creating and understanding my CMDB so that anybody can use it. So now that you've worked out what CIs are required, how are they going to be ranked? What will be, what will be the top? What will be the bottom? I'll show you what that looks like. What information about those CIs is required to meet that goal? Where am I going to get that information? Rule of thumb, this is where the tools come back in. If I can get a tool to automate this, fantastic. But I need to understand which bits are going to be automated and which bits need humans. How are my CIs going to be linked to each other? Once you've agreed those rules, you can start building test services and saying, well, this should work if using these rules, can I? So let me walk you through what that actually looks like. Then we're going to hang a hand over to Faisal and say, well, let's, let's see a CMDB project and in the real world. Okay. First thing you do, get your right people in the room. Someone said we want a CMDB. Okay, why? Who's going to use it? What are they going to use for? Quick question you want to fire off up front because ITIL isn't clear on this. It sort of leaves it to you. Is your CMDB going to be an offline trusted state? As in, this is what your um, configuration is authorized to appear like, or is it an up to minute reflection of the live environment? Very simple question, has rather profound implications on which style of CMDB you're going to create. The goal will go into your scope, so make sure it's clear in your mind what it is the point of the tool is going to be. If you can make a problem statement to focus you, that's even better. Problem is we have too many uh, high, high impact changes being miscategorized. Right, now that I understand what the problem is, I can now start to build you a tool to help with it. So we're gonna say, I want one to help me with change management. Uh, too many high impact changes, great, fine, love it. Which CIs do you want to include? Which will you exclude? Do not, under any circumstances, simply say, well, the tools allow me to grab all of this information. I'll just shove that in my CMDB. Okay, so the general rule of thumb is add new categories of CIs as if it costs, as if each one costs you a toenail. You really, really, really do not want to make this a metadata dumping ground. Look at it and say, well, what else can I take out and it still be useful? That is the right frame of mind. You do not have massive amounts of resources to keep this thing up to date. Tools will help. They won't do everything. So everything in my CMDB that I'm going to make sure is accurate and useful has got to pull its own weight. So there are no free rides on this one, thank you. So what's my scope? What could it look like? Well, I tend to actually put it out and say, well, I don't want these sorts of items because, but what I do want is, and that's it, I literally have, these are the items that I need to actually know about. And at this point, your planning phase, just try to work out, get yourself a gut feel, how many of these sorts of things are you signing up for? I need to know about business services, technical services, servers, network nodes, and so on and so on and so on and so on. You need to bring whoever you're doing this for in at this point. If it's change management, you want to ask them. You know those big, chunky changes that kept failing, you know, kept failing stuff? Well, we're, we're trying to help, but could you tell me what items they were on? Mostly, I recognize there's always an old card. I'm not here to build you a battle tank. I don't have enough money. I'm here to give you body armor and protect the most vital things. So what are the most vital? And very quickly, you'll probably come down to some variant of this stuff. Big, chunky network kit, database, servers, services, maybe some applications. And that tends to be the things that can kill your organization. So they're the ones that you want to sort out. All right, I now know what's in scope and out of scope. 
how are they going to be ranked? The only reason you want this in is to make sure that the same rules are applied each time. When I do an impact assessment, it goes and it looks upstream, downstream, peer-to-peer. Fine. You'll need to spend some time working out what is the top, what is the bottom. Here's a pro tip. I honestly don't care what sits on what layer. It literally only exists to make sure all the humans can work out in their own minds what sits where when they're creating a new IT service and interpreting the impact assessment. Don't get hung up. Should it go on tier two or tier three? I don't care. Roll a dice. As long as at the end of it, you've all agreed that's what sits where. It's a short step, but an important one. Where are you going to get your attributes from? Because the information now is, well, what information about those items do I need to provide? Okay, so make, model, serial number, status, support. For each CI, make that list. What information do I have to provide you to give you useful information? Then your question becomes, where am I going to get that information from? And this is where our friends, the tools, start turning up. Well, that field I can fill in on those items from um, SCCM. That one I can get from Alteris. This one I can get from SolarWinds. That one I can get from, it's federating, it's pulling together and putting it all into one place. Should you need it, you could have the, equality, you could have the ability to have an, a second one audit. So SCCM and SolarWinds could give me that. Oh, good, I'll cross-check the two things on there. From your own point of view, put in the quality of data as well. This is a subjective thing, but it's telling you where you expect your problem children to be as you go as you go on. As you know from configuration management, part of your job is to go and perform those audits. Well, that's fine, but the tool set is just basically doing me doing the audits on 90% of it, and I trust them because that's what the tool's there to do. My audits will be on the bits the humans have to put in such as the, um, the sort of uh, depreciation, the residual of financial areas. That's probably a human having to put it in. They're the areas that errors creep into. They're the areas that I will audit rather than looking at serial numbers. So I now know what I'm doing it for. I've worked out what items, CIs, I'm going to need. I've said what information about those CIs I'm going to need. I've worked out in which order they're going to appear, at the top, at the bottom, so I can start doing my impacts. But I've got an issue here. Typically, a tool, when I put it up, will show me information like this. That shows me there's a connection. Well, that's good. But I need. it was designed to help change management. They're not supposed to just be sitting there and going, oh, well, I see there's a connection. They need to know what is that connection. Again, I find it helps. Pull yourself a, a list. Okay, backs up, consists of, data creates data feed, fails over, governs, is protected by. Come up with a list of 10 maximum. Should cover most of the areas for you. Why are you doing this? because I want to know how they're going to interact. When a firewall meets a firewall, use the one of fails over. When a firewall meets a WAN link, have protects. What I'm doing is building a common understanding for all my humans to say, when you're building these services, build them like this. Heck, go and talk to your tool set vendors and say, is your tool smart enough to have this logic built into it? So that when this CI and this CI meet, can the tool set itself suggest, we suggest that you use, is protected by? I don't want people to have different views. It's supposed to be presenting the information that's going to be useful to them. Some tools can do this, some don't. It's good to know if, you, good to know if you're picking one to ask about it. I like to color code mine. A red link is this, you know, the service dies if this link is broken. A green link is, look, there's a backup, there's something else going on. The service doesn't die, it's just irritating. At a glance, change management aren't just told there's a, you know, there is a connection. I could look at it and go, there is a connection, it's a red one, and it's data flowing between the two. Hey, have you spoken to this team? They need to know about this. Suddenly, I've got a tool. So let's just work, let's work through that before I hand across to Faisal and uh, we'll have a look and see some of the examples um, in the real world. At the beginning, work out what you've got. Look out what tools you have. 
you're about to try and build something here. What, you know, what tools do you have to help you build it? Define your goal, day one. Who's going to use it? What are they going to use it for? Now that you know what the goal is, and you've sorted out if it's going to be a trusted offline or a real one, what goes into my CMDB to make sure that I can meet that goal? Be absolutely ruthless. There is nothing, absolutely nothing, like a CMDB for scope creep and bloat. And that is literally fatal to your project. So be very careful with that stuff. Work out the CI ranking just for us humans to say, well, okay, if it's up, um, upstream and downstream, could someone work out what sits where? Work out what attributes about those CIs will be needed to meet that goal. Okay, again, attributes. Each time you've put an attribute in there, you, you are now personally guaranteeing that that attribute will be accurate and reliable. Because the moment it's not accurate and reliable, people lose trust in your tool and they stop using it. So ask your questions. Where does the data come from? How do I keep it up to date? That's the attribute source. Once you've got that, you now have the set of rules. You now you need to have a highly expensive absolutely cutting edge thing called a post-it note. What you do is you get a pack of these, you grab the techies from the relevant teams, half a dozen is usually enough, walk them through the rules and say, that's the goal, these are the items, here's how they fit together, these are the relationships, this is what you use between that one and that one. This is a large meeting room with a large whiteboard. Please, using those rules, and your own knowledge, try to build me an IT service. Okay, now I want you guys to walk out the room and somebody else to walk in the room and look at it and say, does that make sense to you? Then I'm going to repeat the process, learning from it. I'll run it through it several iterations until I find a way that's worked to say, this now works. I can consistently build IT services that present useful information. I can do it with these rules. I can do it with any of my technical teams who have you know, a decent level of understanding. Now, I'm over to go and see the tool set vendors and say, I need you to be able to replicate what I've just done into your tool, because that's what I need out of you. What I'm going to do now is just very, very briefly, before I hand over to Faisal, quickly say, here's some of the areas that break people. First one, failing to identify the goal or benefit of the CMDB. Okay, so that's a variant of what I've been talking about. Yeah, we, we, you can say it's, it's difficult to come back. You've just spent a lot of money on building a tool. Well, what did the tool do and did it make it better? The one which gets most people is the metadata dumping ground. The CMDB is my holiest of holies. If it's in there, I guarantee it's accurate. If it's not in my CMDB, it doesn't mean that we're not tracking it. It means it's happening somewhere else, in an inventory tool, in an outer layer. Please make sure that you include change management. Do not include anything in the CMDB that cannot be controlled and checked, because then I don't know if what I'm feeding you is useful information or not. Building a CMDB in the ivory tower, I sat off in room X, I pulled together all of these things, and I've now emerged and said, we have a CMDB, fantastic, everyone will love me. No, this is a tool. It's going to be used at the end of the day by the technical teams and the process areas. You might want to actually talk to them, making sure it does what they need. If at the end of the day you hand me a tool and tell me, that's yours, use it now, and walk off, and I don't understand what it does for me, how to use it, or even why I should, I'll use it whenever you look at me and quietly get back to my own comfortable little world. Don't go nuts attempting to broad an implementation. I will map the top 10 most important services from my business impact analysis because that gives me a starting point. It also protects me, body armor, on the things that are most important to me. Once I know that that's working, I'll expand it to the next 10 and then the next 10. Trying to flip a switch and saying, we'll have absolutely everything. Yeah, good luck. Skimping on process and training. The CMDB is a tool. It's only as useful as the people who use it. Please make sure that you've actually given some thought in t telling people how to use this thing. Otherwise, what tends to happen is you create a lovely CMDB. Only one person in the IT department knows how to actually do 
impact assessment to get information out of it, all these sorts of things. That person's not around all the time. The CMDB sinks like a stone because people don't want to wait for that one to turn back up. Last but not least, ITIL says you should never have your scope of the CMDB outside the change management, as I said earlier on. So if, if change control does not include Blackberries, do not stick Blackberries in your CMDB. I don't have any ability to validate if it's up to date or not. But that doesn't mean that just because change management is tracking something, I must in my CMDB. If a BlackBerry bake breaks, yes, it's irritating, I'll get you something different. If the BlackBerry server breaks, ah, now we're, now we're a bit more worried. Spend your time armoring the bits that, manage, that matter the most. Okay, a final thought before I hand you across to Faisal to actually talk about this in the real world. Good design isn't just what you add, it's what you take away. And with that, Faisal, I'm going to hand across to you. Control is over to you, sir. Thank you very much, Peter, for that um, illuminating discussion on all the aspects of the critical importance of CMDB and the importance of getting CMDB right. And I think um, it's a, it sort of moves into the theme that I want to sort of discuss now uh, in terms of how can you translate that understanding that we've sort of discussed in, 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 in quite a level of detail into um, an operational environment. And then what I'll do is, I'm, over the next few slides, I'm going to go through some example, an example of how we, get, we can approach the solution, and also a case study um, from, our, uh, from our experiences at Scient, where we've actually implemented uh, this in anger, if you like. And what we'll do is, uh, you know, and we obviously can take obviously questions at the end when we round off, so we'll walk through that. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to walk through, like a story. Uh, many of you will be familiar with this um, in terms of your own operational environments and in your own specific um, experiences, but we'll, we'll go through that and see. And what, what we'd like to, dr to drive out of this is why having a, a CMDB, an effectively configured, configured CMDB for your particular business context is really important getting operational insights out of, um, uh, out of your business so that you can provide effective service management. So what are the challenges? Now some of the challenges you, you can see here are going to be common across all your environment. And typically we've, in, in, our, in, the, in the business, in looking at service management um, from the top if you like, we get a lot of uh, questions. All these are typical questions that we, we have. We find out about, for example, what about service outages from, uh, from customers? Um, questions we get are, we don't have visibility to monitor and manage our SLAs effectively or we spend too much time looking at uh, repetitive tasks. And why is that? If you look, uh, if you look in, in, in the context, you have the things that um, Peter touched upon, complex and siloed IT environment, a large number of tool sets and systems which are feeding in um, into, your, into your business, which you need to support to be able to manage. Of course, SLA violations, the generation of too many trouble tickets for uh, numerous problems, often duplicated problems, um, from your um, IT infrastructure or from your, from your service, which is, impact, which is underpinned by your IT infrastructure, these are other kind of challenges that we typically come across. Very important, too many duplicated and underutilized tools. Um, you know, Peter touched about get, ensuring that your tool set is mapped to your CMDB so you get the value out of it to manage your service. And that's a really important theme that we have to understand in any assessment that you approach. Regulatory compliance is another area. There may be, especially in the comms industry, um, it, you know, you're going to have certain regulatory compliances on SLAs or from the uh, you know, federal boards uh, as to how you can ensure the uh, um, customer satisfaction as well. And of course, resources. Having an overworked knock or too many resources applied looking at your different, um, and it could be your network element managers, it could be your event management systems, it could be your other tool sets which are, which are required to support your overall service. There's a lot of these complexities that will often happen which can lead to what we can effectively call a lot of challenges and issues within service management. Can I just so jump in for one second here, sure. Faisal? We've had a question raised, which is, can my company pass an ISO 20000 certification using an Excel CMDB? All right, I, am a four, I have been trained. I am formally certified in ISO 20000 auditing. So the answer is simple. Yes. ISO 20000 says you must have a CMDB. There is nothing in there about what tool sets you must use. So 
My apologies. I just wanted to answer that one before for the, whoever it was who just raised that question. My apologies. Please carry on, Faisal. No, not at all, Peter. And no, I think hopefully that answers the uh, the question there. Um, and uh, of course, as we go along, please feel 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 free to raise any questions as we go through um, uh, through the through the rest of the uh, webinar. So the next uh, a solution approach. Now this is an approach that we look down at every layer of how you can get a, an effective uh, service management operations out, um, uh, um, um, from from looking at everything from your from your bottom up. It's a top down approach as you look here, but we're looking at all the different components and how they fit together. So right at the top you can see, and this is really we can spell out the importance is the importance of having CMDB and a properly orchestrated CMDB, and that will include a lot of key elements. It'll include your, uh, you know, your, the incidents and problems that typically are coming from your environment. It's going to look at your service catalog, very important when I, we talk about service catalog. In fact, the whole webinar could be done on service catalog alone. Is mapping your service identifiers to your CIs, to your configuration items as you like, and of, of course to your asset and your inventory areas, and ultimately your SLA. Having that model in place, and typically that was driven by a well-defined CMDB, if uh, you take the effort to work on that, will amalgamate the different tools and the different asset and inventory uh, systems that you have and the data therein to match your particular service. That doesn't mean you map everything. You don't need to have to map everything. But those elements that are impacting your service. That's the critical thing that needs to be done at this level. Because otherwise, you'll simply recreate the problem in the CMDB that you already have in your operational environment. So having a proper assessment and a proper analysis phase here is what we've typically done with our customers, really helps because it helps them identify the challenges that they have with their different tools and data. It helps them to rationalize the CMDB when they start to build it, and it helps to see what can you get out of that when you start to go into the realms of fault and performance management. So that's where we have the next level, fault and performance management. The underpinning aspect of that is the, is the CMDB and the rationalization of the tool sets that support it. That really needs to be your initial step. You may have, for example, many systems. You may have the BMCs, you may have HP there, you may have IBM, you could have your existing legacy systems there from, uh, as well, in-house open source systems. Whatever it is, what value you get out of them depends on how the service is configured to manage that and, and what business impact is coming out that you need to manage and monitor. So that's a key important point about uh, looking at this from that approach onwards. We then look at what we have in the concept within scientists called actionable dashboards. We, we look at defining operational uh, dashboards at the highest level, we typically call a single pane of glass, which allows you to take those feeds, which hopefully have been rationalized by this stage, to give you an overall view. Now that could sit in your NOC, could, it could sit in your NOC, or in your SOC rather, it could sit in anywhere your, uh, where your environment is, to give you an overall, o overarching view of what's going on in your network. But more importantly, by this stage, it will be correlated so that, and with the root cause analysis applied so that you can see what really is impacting. And that's what we term as actionable, dash, actionable dashboards uh, uh, concept, which you'll see in a few further slides as to um, uh, a real-world example of this. If you look at the right-hand side of the slide very quickly, this is what we talk, talk about plan, build, and run. So if, before you even go into building your, your uh, or integrating your um, IT service management suite or solution, if you like, You've got to understand what the problem is. So you've got to align the IT processes with what, with what, you, what, the, what your operation requires. You've got to look at the tools rationalization. Do you have, are the tools fit for purpose? Do you need all those tools? Or it may well be that they are, or it may well be that not. You have to have that sort of analysis has to be done before you move to the next stage. And then, of course, you need a, a solution and implementation plan to move that forward. The build could require automation of some of those processes. We've done that for some of our um, customers. May it will certainly require some level of integration, possibly, with the different tool sets to ensure that you have the right presentation layer when you come to looking at your dashboard. And then, of course, run. Once those positions are in place and you've tested that, how, can, how will this work operationally in a real-time sort of production or real-time operating environment? So your 24-7 your support, your service desk. Ultimately, this will, this will be what will rationalize and produce an effective service desk, which your service desk resources can then use to resolve problems in your operational environment. So here's some of what we, what we term the building blocks of service assurance. Um, so 
we see this, this is like a stepwise approach. It's a journey that we would work with our customers to take them so that they get effective service management um, solution at the end, which they can then use operationally. So if you look at, every, if you look at sort of the first step, monitoring instrumentation, uh, instrumentation fault performance, you already have your monitoring tools in place. You'll have your performance tools in place. You may have network element managers in place. You could have probes, syslog probes. You could have uh, server management. Whatever your business requires, you're going to, of course, have that core base element of information that's coming from your environment. And that would be sort of your, obviously, your first step, your basic step, which, which typically will always be there. The next step, which has really been the focus of this uh, webinar, has been discovery and CMDB. Ensuring your CMDB is correct and fit for purpose for your business. And that, that means ensuring that the, the asset elements, the service line elements are there. And also, when you talk about discovery, it's ensuring that the CMDB is in sync with the reality. And that was sort of mentioned by P in Peter as well, sort of his latter slides, was you know, ensuring that what's in the CMDB remains in sync, that in, in sync with the operational environment, with your, it could be your network, it could be your server farm, whatever, or, or it could be your other monitoring systems to ensure that the CMDB is consistent and concurrent. It's always there to support your business. That's a really important stage where we would discuss, um, uh, you know, as part of this, uh, this, 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 uh, these, this step, these building blocks. And then, of course, automation and integration. And once you've got that established, you've got to look at, can you automate some of the processes that manage the service management flow? Can you look at integrating some of those tool sets, possibly replacing some of those tool sets? Those are the kind of things that we would talk to our customers about to make them think about that before you reach the final step, if you like, or, uh, which is the actionable dashboard, the operational dashboard that would sit, uh, the pane of glass view that would sit, which all these underlying infrastructure would feed into. So this is sort of the journey we would sort of take us, uh, our customers on, and we have done in some of our operation environments. And it's like an approach of how we, how we do it. The best thing is we need to talk to the customer to understand what the problem is before we move and give them the solution. So CMDB benefits, I've taken this out from one of those steps specifically because it really ties into it, to, to what we've been talking about today. If you get your CMDB right, and if you get the touch points in the configuration right, you can get, you can, we, we can get these, and we've seen these accrue from our, uh, some of our example. One of the examples that we'll close with in the next few slides shortly is you'll get better forecasting and planning of changes. And that comes into the importance of having the change management as well as the asset and the other infrastructure process mapped into that. So that CMDB doesn't just be a, a, a dumb system. It's a, a proactive system which is supporting your services. So that should improve operational efficiencies. Uh, improve impact analysis because you now have a proper CMDB defined with the service levels mapped to your CI and to your assets, uh, uh, thereby allowing you to have traceability when an incident problem occurs. So if you have an alarm or an event that comes in the system, you'll have that traceability, which hopefully your CMDB will provide through to your tools and your system to give that visibility um, of what the problem is. And of course, this should uh, this typically will help you. Uh, identify the service impacting costs and also mean time to repair um, for your instance. Having that important first course uh, uh, CMDB correctly defined for your business needs uh, is really important to be able to, to, to move on to these other aspects uh, and get this value from, uh, from, this, from your service manager or your service desk. So typically, you know, in a service uh, assurance area, you're going to have tools which are added in and potentially ad hoc tools, legacy tools, which are mapping into your um, uh, environment. Some of these tools might be isolated. You may have, for example, one tool which has been looking at one part of the maybe server management. You could have two or three different element managements from different element managers for different vendors for the network. Over time, your solution, as you, you know, mergers and acquisitions, can bring in new systems, new OSS landscapes into the, into the uh, fray. So this will create a very frag quick, can potentially create a highly fragmented and often difficult, difficult to manage um, environment, which leads to um, effectively frustration on the on the part of um, IT services and of course uh, your users as well. So our concept that we have within Science is called Smart View, um, and that's based upon the actual dashboard concept that I discussed earlier. What we aim to do is we transform this uh, sort of uh, environment, which was could you could have numerous uh, vendors in there, could, you, know, you could have legacy uh, open source systems there as well. The aim is to try and give you a view 
from those steps that I mentioned before, which will allow your, um, whether it's your executives, whether it's uh, operational staff, to get the value, the, to see the problem as effectively as possible without having to go through numerous processes of drill downs or different systems that they have to go through, reducing swivel chair activities effectively. So that transforms that into this. And, the, and you can see there, this is an, an actual example. And this sort of leads, it leads into the case study. It's for NYC SmartView. We worked with the New York um, Department of um, IT and Telecommunication, um, with SIGNT. And we basically looked at, uh, they had obviously, can uh, imagine this is across, uh, in, in, across New York City, Manhattan, the suburbs, all the, uh, uh, all NYC, uh, affecting municipality, it's a department, the council, required a solution which would be able to manage things like, uh, you know, emergency calls from the fire department, it would be able to cause uh, network problems within the telecom sector, and also, uh, you know, alarms and other outages that are coming from the systems uh, and the underlying municipality groups as well. So what we did was, in this case, we provided what's called the NYC, based on our smart view solutions, we provided them a single pane view, which sat in their NOC, and that's a picture of their NOC there, which we uh, helped them do. And that's provided a number of key benefits uh, to NYC in terms of operational performance and efficiencies and mean time to repair. So what did this do for, for, for NYC? We basically helped to put them uh, on the dashboard. In this case, we gave them an actionable dashboard solution um, to be able to um, uh, more effectively monitor um, the network. And you know, from the uh, network monitoring team manager, you sort of a citation there, they're monitoring bits and pieces of their core services, but they do not have the end-to-end -end visibility for service modeling and tracking SLA performance. And what the actionable dashboard solution did was was able to resolve some of these challenges like a complex service environment, uh, management environment, problems correlating different issues which might have the same root cause, and of course outages and performance issues. And what was the solution? As I discussed before, we walked through the customer here, we talked to them, we looked at their uh, solution design in terms of what the problem, the, the core problem was. We looked at a CMDB. Now this wasn't a massive CMDB. This is a CMDB that was configured to manage their, their key issues and, uh, and challenges, which required tools rationalization, management of vendors, and very importantly, identifying the processes and optimizing them so that they matched the service model rather than the tools driving the process. It was the process which needs to drive the tools. And of course, uh, ultimately, we provide a smart view solution to give an end-to-end -end view uh, of the overarching um, uh, solution. So the final slide, um, uh, last but not least, um, is, this, is a view of uh, the actual benefits that were provided um, to New York City by this uh, dashboard solution. And there's a picture of their NOC, um, I think it's based in Manhattan. And effectively, what did we provide? The outcome was a single plane visibility was given of IT infrastructure and comms. Uh, and this is across, you know, NYC obviously, as we know, covers 8 million residents. In the, in the municipalities, there were 300,000 employees managing potentially 20, 20, 230k businesses and 120 uh, public agencies as well. And the benefits they came out um, uh, as uh, uh, were, were significant. Uh, you know, we had a 50% reduction in mean time to repair. We had a 60 to 90% improvement in service availability. And uh, you know, we were a reduction in sort of things like service outages. And of course, there was a citizen hotline as well. The citizen hotline within New York City, um, you know, we had, a, a, you know, we were able to pr produce and manage more calls by having effective service, a service desk solution for them to be able to react more effectively to problems that occurred um, within the IT and telecoms infrastructure. So I think this gives you sort of a, 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 a feel of a case study of, um, of a real-time uh, 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 application of the concepts that we discussed on the webinar. I think taken from Peter's initial discussion, really sort of building blocks, roots are really important here to ensure your CMDB and your tool sets are properly aligned with your service, and that will give you the, um, uh, uh, the, the, the approach which can build up to having a, an, a, a solution here. And here's an example of, of um, uh, a successful implementation of that in the real world. So I think um, at, at that point, I'll probably a close uh, uh, the discussion, or maybe open it up for questions rather. Um, and so uh, back over to you, Peter. Uh, sort of, this has given sort of an overview of the uh, 
uh, of a case study or of those concepts within the um, within the real world. Excellent. Well, thank you very much, Heisel. Well, if anyone has any questions either about the uh, um, the, the, the case study or the sort of approach to creating a CMDB, um, now would be the time. We'll sort of just wait for a moment or two to see if any questions. Um, I'm just going to sort of say that a lot of people have problems with creating the CMDBs. I think we've established this earlier earlier on. But also, what I've also hoped to show is that the way to deal with them, it is not an insurmountable problem. A lot of it is simply to do with what Faisal and I have talked about, is clear understanding of what the benefits are, what are you trying to get out of this. It's having the ability to say, that's the goal, and then I can work backwards from it. If there's only one thing that I would ask that you take from this um, seminar, you know, this, uh, this web chat, it's that the understanding, the importance of knowing what you want this tool to do, clearly and explicitly stating that's what this tool is here for. Mm. Right. Well, I think we're going to be getting the beep from out of time any moment. It appears that we've stunned you with our eloquence because nobody has any questions or follow-up. If you're just shy and don't want to actually ask them, or if you're listening to the um, to, uh, listening to this offline, please do reach out to either um, Faisal or myself, depending on what which area your question's about. When, what about you, Faisal? I'm, I'm a nice guy. I don't mind receiving emails. No. I'm trying my best to help out. <laughs> No, I, I, I don't mind at all. Um, so uh, you know, feel free to send any questions post the webinar. Um, and um, just to touch on what Peter was saying um, uh, about uh, about the CMDB and uh, and, uh, and sort of the, the takeaways from here, I think the key takeaway here is to really understand what the problem is um, before you dive into the tools and to the uh, and into the, uh, the the system. Is really understand your problem is and then start to look at what you can do from that point onwards. That's what we've seen in uh, we've seen sort of in our experience, uh, both Peter and I. Excellent. Well, in that case, it just remains for me to say that there there is an attachment available talking about um, talking about some of the things that we've discussed. The CMDB scoping workshop fact sheet that's available in the attachments and linked section. So, if what we've spoken about has touched a nerve, or you thought, oh, I want to know some more, please feel free to download that. We hope it's useful. And with that, I shall just say, final thank you so much for joining me. Thank you very much, Peter. It's been a pleasure. And I look forward to doing another one of, one of these with you soon. Thank you very much, everybody. We hope you have a good day. Thank you. Bye-bye.